something's fishy going on. Hmm. Crashed. Hopefully it will be fine. Good evening, Schulstrand. Um, it's not wanna what wanting to behave the way I want it to behave. Some crash, so like render something bugged out. And Firefox is not behaving. Hey Lurib, hey Golden Tigers. You're back, Golden Tigers. How fantastic to have you back. So let's see. Maybe jump straight to the um, to the challenge. Or maybe I should sketch something first. Just to kill some time. Let people drop in. Maybe that's kinder to everyone. So I'm uh, hoping everyone had a fantastic weekend. So far. Let's spend some, just some quick doodle. I like one thing about um, like Anthony Jones process that he has developed lately is this kind of subdued valley range and then he goes with a dark brush and just defines an edge and you know he does it quite fast and it's very comfort zone for him but the result is quite nice with the, like with a controlled uh, very like narrow value range and then he pushes it higher with whatever layer settings he uses or probably overlay or soft light or something but it looks cool it's not a lot of like brush marks per se it's very just a kind of close mass of value and then a darker shadow to help boost things it's, it's a, it has a nice look to it hey Jacob Mobley hey Kuro Kiri Dragon you're new Glad to uh, see a new face. I don't recognize the name Kurokiri. Actually, Kuro, Kuro Kori Dragon. I said that. Were you one of those um, from the raid? Art raid. Graded by channel. I think so, right? Hey, Tone 2005. Triple X. <laughs> nice to see you here as well. So tonight I will be doing a paint over session of the two week challenge I had on Discord and the uh, Discord challenge these two weeks were do uh, fan art of your favorite movie or game in either way you seem fit. Um, so what I did um, I can show mine actually. Uh, I did this even though I didn't finish it. And uh, this is what I chose to do. And I chose to do a uh, Super Metroid uh, fan art. It's still loads to do on it. I will finish it offline uh, if I have time. Um, but yeah, so this was my two week challenge 30 minutes every morning uh, streaming it. But I wish, wish I, I would have had more time. 30 minutes only a day just gets you that far. But at least I finished it, right? That's what counts. I have participated.
tried Kurokori. Uh, I remember the name. I remember having issues pronouncing the the or the the Kurokori Kurokori that whole thing. Glad to see you back. Uh, my as I showed you, Lurip, it's hasn't gone any further. I haven't had time. I had to focus on a day job and, and some freelance and uh, family stuff. Um, I took it on every uh, morning live stream to a point now. That was decent. So what's that? Five days, ten days, uh, five hours total of uh, just random stream moments. I'm pretty decent. Pretty pretty happy with it. Even though five hours for that isn't amazing, uh, it's still pretty okay. The problem is when you're doing line art and so on, if you're very disjointed with time and especially if you have to start and stop and you have to kind of get into the into the zone again. So it's a little bit uh, breaking a painting up in only 30 minutes ago is a little bit like you have to um, get used to it again, especially if you do renders at work and then do warm-ups with line art. It's a little bit confusing. Thanks, Lurib. Um, what I was thinking of doing, actually, on the warm-ups now, uh, starting Monday, was kind of go back to uh, normal, but do it a little bit different. So, uh, so I was thinking, on Monday, I will be asking for uh, a characteristic, so agile, heavy, tank, killer, uh, wizard, <laughs> prophet, and I choose one and I design a character and then um, the next day I refine it. So I do the sketch and then I spend another 30 minute like attempting to wrap it, you know, make it presentable with, of course, within time limit. One hour character sketch, you know, split up in two is just going to be what it is, but it's going to, I think it'll be a fun experiment. So let's say you give me agile, I'll create some character. Then the next morning I'll, I'll refine the idea. I'll, I'll change the changes I need to do, uh, package it in a way that is decent. Um, so ideally, I, I think thinking of if I do uh, one color, you know, top lighting uh, on 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 a dark background kind of way on a character, and then uh, the next day I could like add some colors, just a little bit more life to it, uh, adjust proportions, etc. Et I think that could be a I think that could be a cool little challenge, and then, then I'll ask for another uh, description. Maybe not uh, behavior, but maybe color, or or you know. So it's switching it up, switching it up, and trying to come up with. Maybe I have to do a monster based on the word uh, a color. You know, I think that could be that could be a fun challenge for randomness. Jacob Mobley, yeah, for sure. I, I haven't really followed any of his videos where he does it. All I'm doing now is just reverse engineering his final product um, by memory. So I, I, I know kind of what he does. So now I'm just kind of messing around. It's being stupid. I'm trying to keep it that way, like the as his picture looks. Very crunched the valley range. 
but it, it is effective. You know, it allows you to focus on specific things more. You know, which is kind of cool. Obviously, when you're doing it like he does, you have to focus more on shapes, etc. And not just start randomly like I did, which is extremely counterproductive. Never a good thing to start a drawing when you don't have any idea of where to take it. I guess that's better. Maybe not. The head looked become became very stupid. Yeah, polka monster. It could be an interesting challenge, but very subjective. Maybe polka to me is Nazi Germany. <laughs> you know, or or cheeseburger. Who knows what I, I associate the words with? But that that also leaves the uh, the door open for interesting results. Favorite music genre, superhero. Uh, death metal, <laughs> gospel music uh, opens the opens the door for some some interesting interpretations. Yeah, I mean, I do like reggae, for sure. It's been a part of my life since early teens, actually. I've always been a fan of reggae. Uh, but I also listen to, like, rock and, um, like, uh, chill out, chilled out house music, like, very alternative club music. I mean, if, if those who have followed the streams where I do play music, uh, I did that in the beginning. It's very, like, I, I really enjoy it when they sing well and they use their singing as a, their ro uh, voice as a tool. I really appreciate that as a, you know, like, the, the voice is an instrument. So the genre doesn't really matter that much. It's all down to how they use their voice. And a lot of the modern like, pop music is, the singing is not very good. And uh, I tend not, not to grav gravitate towards that kind of music. Even though like I don't really care that it's pop music. Uh, but the singing is usually... Uh, not a very high quality so I, I kind of keep an ear out for good singers and it doesn't matter if it's uh, whatever genre it is if it's a good good singing it's good singing you know. but it tends to be towards reggae towards uh, kind of alternative chill out house type music um, Yeah, but reggae is, is probably what I listen most to. Jacob Mobley, yeah, it's um, it's an interesting technique he does. I don't know where he's gotten it from. 
but it's a easy way to do stuff and you can get away with lots of things and he probably uses more overlay than I do currently now I'm just painting and I know also I'm, I'm doing too much details I need to focus bigger to small because that's clearly how he does it uh, in this technique like he goes way more faster than this as well most likely I mean I'm drawing now very slow probably what you gotta do to make this technique work better is to just be more reactive or less planning and I think that's what my biggest downfall at the moment here is I'm thinking too much or not concentrating to enough so I'm just kinda trying to solve it rather than just be in the zone and smash something out you know but I thought why not try it and then you have a, you, you let's make a color layer and put in some like high chroma colors blue yellow red Very bright. Yeah, my my way of thinking is definitely more sculptural than uh, line. But that being said, I am most comfortable in doing lines for some reason. Um, and painting only form is something I have had to uh, practice because my f I, I remember at the beginning of learning everything my innate reaction is to go to line art because of like comic uh, background or and a big fan of comics as a kid and so on everything is without lights in, in comics so that's where I got it and I had I had to really work hard not to think in outline but think in form and that an outline is just where an edge meet with each other <laughs> that becomes a line Jacob Mobley, yeah, definitely. The soft light does that. It it does like tighten the value range. And you can push it further. But like I said, I'm, I'm not doing it. Probably not correctly like he does. And I'm not trying to ex exactly mimic him either. I'm just kind of doing that limited value range quick sketch. But it works. But like I said, he he does like I said he does probably the overlay or soft light layer settings to crunch it even more because it looks like very like dense. Could probably do it like this. I probably need to adjust the. Uh, Range like that. Oh, look, Mom, I'm Anthony Jones. <laughs> hey, aluminium. So I think this little stupid doodle is just that stupid doodle. So let's get to the challenge, shall we? So, uh, uh, this one, I don't know. Is it Dragon Hunter? Ray? Rue? I don't know which game. Don't kill me. But it's done by Nefaz from uh, the, co uh, the community um, it's a cool painting I think the, the, for me the biggest issue is um, the composition um, 
I like, I kind of like the palette. I like the placement of him. I like the placement of the sword, the the, the shadow of this. Uh, I think it's a sword or axe. Shadow, shadow of the axe. Uh, I like the like the idea of it. But I think what's prob problematic is the composition. Because a lot of the uh, focus is down here, and all of this is wasted. Um, I get it, like, if you want to show uh, this character being, like, alone in the world. If you would make the, if you would make the composition more like that. And, um, you know, so that becomes a he becomes a lot smaller in the picture and then having uh, some purpose for this empty space and not just dead dead air right so maybe a planet maybe clouds maybe uh, a, some goal in the distance or uh, magical night sky whatever but as is when it's just when it's just a guy sitting at the golden ratio without any reasoning, like it, it's lacking a lot of potential impact. And like the narrative is lost, and and the composition doesn't work because there's no point in it. I should undo that crop by the way. Yeah, so there's a lot of like space that that is screaming for for um, attention, and uh, I mean uh, placement like this would make sense if there's text. placement of text that would would make sense of the the aspect ratio right but as the painting is there and then there's nothing to support uh, the rest of the image uh, you're lacking it becomes like no point in it another thing could be to extend it uh, horizontally You know, then then the, the the narrative becomes completely different, uh, but that being said, also, uh, but besides the compositional thing, I think the axe is uh, too close to the edge of the canvas, so I would I would probably move it out a little bit, so it's not almost touching. There is this is um, <laughs> on useful links in, in Discord, I posted many uh, extra streams ago uh, about uh, edge rules. And one of them is being like almost at the edge or intersecting the edge and so on. It's uh, like compositional. Uh, and also, a lot of edges are very soft, except here. You know, uh, it's a really important thing to, to try to vary the intensity and the sharpness of edges to help the eye uh, move through the painting. And uh, I'm not going to change the value range. I'm just going to start sharpening edges. And um, the rhythm of the painting will change dramatically without me even adjusting any of the of the values. but having a sharp and a lost edge does a lot by not you know we don't need to do a black and white line in a painting to have contrast uh, sharpness can be different as well and that can you can build a mid-range painting with 
extremely subtle value shifts, but all you're doing is focusing on edge sharpness and lost edges and firm edges and, and uh, hard edges, and you can create an interesting image purely based on that. So uh, when you start adding um, value uh, to your painting, you have to uh, keep in mind um, not to just do it with contrast, but sharpness as well, which is a huge part of a, uh, an attractive painting. Uh, is like how does the uh, edges work? Uh, and one guy that's really really good at it is uh, let me try to find him here. You you know him? Uh, <laughs> I'm quite sure of it. This is not like a uh, some secret guy here. Um, I just need to find a good example. Our all. Um, I swear, is he? Where is he? There's a lot of copycats for a reason. Um, oh, come on. What? Of course, I won't find it when I need to find it, but Piotr Jablonski <laughs> completely butchered his name. I'm sorry, buddy. I'm sure I'm pronouncing your name. I even know the guy, which makes it even worse. Um, but it's the guy that has done a lot of stuff for. Uh, Dishonored and fantasy stuff. There we go. He has these like Polish letters, which is hard to to figure out. But let me find one a really good example of like how how he plays with edges. Um, and it's all all not just one type of edge uh, and contrast. Um, I think this one is pretty good. So here, um, here you can clearly see like he plays with contrast, like a line going through the middle of the painting, the square to show him, then the white. That's just value, right? And then we look at the edges and, and some of the sharpness of the edges over here. Uh, like there's a lost edge. Well, there's a sharp edge. Uh, like a firm edge. And here is a, a lot of lost edges. And we're kind of floating through the painting looking at sharp and soft edges. And dictates a lot of where we should look. And over here, you know, there's uh, crunched details. And there's some uh, slight or lost edge uh, where the hand goes, and the hand has a firm edge around it, and there's a very sharp or hard edge at the top of the arm, uh, lost edge where the shirt meets the hand, and so on. It, it creates this interesting. Uh, it creates this interesting rhythm, and uh, and that's that's my point. Like what I want to do is, is like if you take that translation to this one, imagine the square that around the train uh, driver is the dark of the character, right? That's like your statement in values, and then you have to start thinking, okay, how should my edge work be? Where do I want us, the viewer, to look? Looking at the environment, most likely, you know, to to understand where is he sitting? Why is he sitting? Uh, you know, world placement and so on, and then whatever these are looks like dinosaurs or something. Uh, you know, where is the hard edges? Where where is it important for us to look? Because we look for hard edges, and then we we follow where soft edges are, and then we we focus again when we start seeing 
uh, a change in rhythm because the human brain looks for patterns. Um, so it's really important that like, uh, when you do place brush marks, uh, you think about or you make decisions about where, what's the rhythm of the path of the eye, right? Where do you want us to look? Is it important that we look at the sharpness of this shadow all the way in? Or can there be like a lost edge to that shadow in the corner? Because we don't really need to trace it all the way in, right? We need to just understand it's a sharp shadow because it's a sharp axe, right? And the rest we can kind of fade out. And you can only get that by adjusting the, the sharpness of your brush marks. And uh, because if you if you do that focus uh, with the contrast, you're going to have a broken image because contrast, in a way, has to follow light source. And edges are outside of that. Edges are just uh, focal points, right? Of, of because the human eye has selective focal points. When we look at something, we our brain automatically blurs other parts fades them out, you know, they're not important. So it's important to think about where is you as a creator want the person to look, where is the important part, where where do you want the, the story to go, right? And that comes with practice, that comes with conscious thought, uh, that comes with composition, all of those things tie in together. So just by, by just paying attention to it and playing with it. Um, another thing also uh, comes with application. So that when you do start something big, you know, you, let's say you, you block something in with a big brush and then you make a brush mark that, that, that is to be the statement. Maybe that is enough. Or maybe you just need to go in and slightly, slightly adjust an edge, and then that's it, you know. Or you know that, okay, I have to start building the image up. I need to start adding like different colors because you know the end goal. Like, okay, you have to put the later on, you know you have to make an overlay layer to make it look shiny uh, because it's shiny metal. So you, you, you know your steps ahead of time. Um, your process, because your process is an important thing to learn as well. How do you go about making an image? Anyway, so you do all these big brush strokes, big to small, right? Because you can't go into final detail at the very beginning because it, you don't know the finished painting yet. So you just do that, big to small, and, and work everything uh, with those steps you need and knowing that, okay, I'll I'll play with edges later because I need to build up the image to that point. You know that's fair, fair, fair enough as well. As it's just a matter of being aware of the situation and what you need to do. Yeah. So that is my feedback for you, Nifas. Um, it's to be challenge thirteen, I think. Hopefully, that will make sense uh, because you know, color-wise, palettes. This the problem is not there. The problem is uh, just not enough edge work, and uh, we don't know where to look other than the axe and the composition in narrative is lacking a little bit of more structure or things to look at. And a lot of that is just because there's one mass of brushwork. Uh, so that's it. And this one is uh, Jacob Mobley. It's fantastic Zelda stuff. I mean, we could look at the characters separately 
and but I'll, I'll I choose to look at it first as a composition. I think the decision to make it into a circle is cool. I think uh, I think they're too tight. Uh, the circle is too tight with the logo and so on. I think they need a little bit more space, a little bit more breathing room. Uh, and um, it just kind of confuses rather than aids the read. Uh, especially the guy here is just crushed in. And the placement of this versus uh, that, you know, could be, could be definitely better. Um, I think what all of them are lacking, especially when you, you're doing a composition, is um, like the logical uh, placement of them, right? Like they are all designed with like a neutral light, right? But they're placed so that the light source makes sense towards the center to some degree. Um, but the question comes then, like, how how are you going to do it so it's it's understandable and readable? You know, maybe you need to uh, have a more dramatic statement so that when we do look at the when we do look at the 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 painting, the kind of the logical part of understanding the painting just makes sense because we're tying the circle with the center you know just kind of have that light be significantly stronger um, so that the statement is clear so that it's not this in-between uh, vagueness where oh, I'm butchering her face on top <laughs> heavy-handed uh, paint over. Um, anyway, so because also with with a decision like this, you're making a, a decision for the person watching about uh, material uh, volume, and when uh, when the light is muted uh, and and it's just like a local light and not a global light situation, we don't. We don't read the mass, the the mass of the whole uh, composition together, right? We look at it only in isolation. Like now, we they are not connected. Uh, it just looks like a bunch of colors, but with <laughs> my heavy hand and paint over, uh, they now connect to each other because they all adhere to the to the light source right so that that makes more sense uh, so if you look at the characters themselves I, th I think the design is cool um, there's a lot of nice shapes going on but most of them uh, with when it comes to shadow groups they become a little bit too messy, especially the ones with hair, where you're trying to focus on the hair too much. Um, what you gotta do more is what you've done on the um, on the hair over there. <laughs> How do you like my English? The hair, hair over there. <sighs> yeah, so, in general, it's a matter of uh, edges. A lot of your edges is there, there uh, in your shadow groups. Uh, shadow groups being groups where the value of the terminator, you know, the classic rendering sphere, um, you know, just for everyone else. I think Jacob probably knows this, but terminator is the point of uh, the sphere where the sun or the light stops hitting and it turns towards shadow and the other parts you know bounce light comes in and, and all these things but the edge like the equator of earth <laughs> kind of but obviously not the equator of earth but you get the idea like the 
rim of the object, uh, that line is called a terminator. So if you have a peanut uh, type shape, right, the terminator is, is based on, first of the, the, the volume of the object, uh, but the edge and direction of the light source, etc., etc. So the terminator is, yeah. So the problem with, and uh, what I was saying with shutter groups is how you group uh, the point of the terminator on, on the object you're painting together with the light, the lit part, so that when you look at it, you read it in a harmonious way, right? So that if you create a lot of small shadow groups, uh, like on her head, we're not seeing the head, we're just seeing all these small high contrast groups of light and shadow. And that's, uh, that becomes easily confusing. So what I'm trying to say is, especially in the placement where you do hair, uh, you need to simplify a lot of the groups and and also make sure that the rhythm uh, of the hair uh, have uh, a, a higher range of different shapes so that you have a bigger, cleaner area that dictates the overall volume and then you can group them smaller and, and you can indicate uh, higher frequency bands of hair, etc., where it's needed. But if it's a blanket treatment across a volume, you don't read the volume. You read each individual uh, treatment, you know. So it becomes, uh, they beca all become separate objects. And that's why, for example, this guy at the bottom there, he reads really well because the, the hierarchy of the shapes the placement of them, they all create uh, individual patterns, but as a whole, it reads clearly. And that's a lot of problem with your hair, is that a lot of edges are equally hard, a lot of uh, shadow groups are uh, too small, and you, you get this uh, disjointed rhythm where, where you don't read the hair as a whole. You just look at all the small objects and, and it becomes a distraction from the, the big picture, right? Then the big picture is her hair, not each uh, lock uh, lock group of uh, her strands of hair, right? So that that would be um, I think that would be the biggest issues they have is that kind of broken rhythm. That you need to be a lot stronger uh, in in those decisions, and especially here in this section, that's nice. You need to do more of that. So, like a block treatment of a huge mass of shadow, right? Thinking about that 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 warm up I did with uh, imitating Anthony Jones, uh, that simplified sh larger groups of shadow or value, and then uh, pointing it out with darker value just to, to help the, the kind of fine play take a bigger part so that you don't need to create this high in, in high frequency details uh, everywhere. You need to be more wise where you put your effort uh, in overall readability. And then like I explained to Nefaz where about the edges, then you go in and decide, okay, here are where I want to go to look, like a look at the eyebrow or maybe the eyebrow is secondary, maybe it's too high frequency shape. So you want to maintain the shape, but the value difference is very subtle. So we get the shape without that high contrast intensity so that you can direct the eye maybe to the detail, density of details in the iris or the, around the eye or the earring. All these things, uh, you know, you need to choose your battles more. Um, but overall, the design is cool. The shapes are cool. Um, the the palette is nice. Uh, it just needs that that extra extra next step. And also also very low key. Uh, 
Um, I, that would be my um, that would be my biggest feedback for you, uh, Jacob. The design stuff is cool. You, you know, you got that part down. You got your style down. That's not the really an issue here. Just composition, that uh, rim light, uh, up the contrast. Choose your battles with the uh, edges and values and shadow groups. And uh, yeah, you'll be laughing. <laughs> right, I'm just going to be a quick, quick pit stop. I'll be right back. Interestingly enough, this is um, Eric Moyes. Uh, I I was a surfing art station before the stream, and um, images. Come on, come on! Don't be this way. Lo and behold, okay, that image apparently doesn't want to work. Someone else have done. Uh, Skeletor. God, it just worked. Ugh. Anyways, obviously didn't want to show, but here's another person's uh, in <laughs> interpretation of uh, Skeletor, which is cool. Um, so I think um, if we disregard the the actual drawing and design for now and uh, look at the colors uh, I think these uh, these two are probably closest to the actual Skeletor Skeletor <laughs> I think these are kinda still Skeletor these are not right by look that's not Skeletor anymore because it's too much human. Skeletor wasn't a uh, human in that sense, right? He was an uh, undead wizard, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so uh, the one thing about doing uh, redesigns um, or, or um, interpretations is that you have to analyze of uh, what dictates the character. You know, what, what makes the character the character. And if you change the colors too much, 
uh, you're not going to think about it uh, that much anymore because uh, really good character designs that are iconic they really made sure that the colors in the whole universe uh, is arranged in a way where each character have their own place in the palette if you look at any cartoon that's worth its uh, weight um, everyone has their own palette right like um, Ash in Pokemon versus some other Pokemon trainers Pikachu versus whatever you know they all have their own ratio of color versus uh, 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 placement or, or uh, what's it called um, come on Real estate, you know, so like Skeletor's mask versus his blue body, that aspect ratio, uh, they have chosen it, right? And the same for He-Man, the same for She-Ra, the same for his tiger, the green tiger with red armor and snot green lines on the body. You know, that, that is all designed, right? It's not just random. So it's a part of the, what I call the napkin test in my character design lecture. Uh, is like if you can boil down a design to its simple components, and still uh, someone is going to be able to say what it is. It's like the napkin test is like you're in a bar, and uh, you only have a napkin, bar napkin, which is shit, and a pen. How can you describe a character? So you have to boil down the character to its bare essentials, like Superman, for example. That's one of the examples I take up. You do the diamond shape on the chest with the S, and the, the curl, and a cape, right? Everyone will go, oh, yeah, it's a Superman. Um, like a problem arises when you have to draw Iron Man, for example. It's, his is very limited. Uh, you, the mask is the most iconic. The rest is kind of like red and blue. Or red and yellow, I mean. Um, so with Skeletor, you have to think, okay, what is the essential? What parts of him can I boil down so that you can still recognize him as Skeletor? So that would be uh, the design design decisions you've made is the skeleton mask, right? And his dark-ish body. Um, and I think a big, one big part of Skeletor is his color. And that's why the ones that are straying away from the palette too far away, they stop being Skeletor, they just become some death guy. So, that being explained, we can start looking at the, the actual drawing. So I won't be commenting more on the color choices, I think that's quite evident uh, where, where that goes. I think for, for the drawing, um, oh, yeah, there's subtle, subtle design variations between only the headgear, right? Yeah, the headgear is different on three, but uh, everything else is, is the same. Right. Yeah. I think I think the drawing it's pretty good. I think um, the hand placement or the hand pose is a bit odd. Uh, he doesn't have power in that hand pose. He's very relaxed, even though he's standing a little bit like you know, like look at me. I'm 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 the boss, and he kind of pointy finger you know doesn't really translate that well uh, I think the, the curvature of the lower leg is very odd um, I get what you want to do I understand that the placement of the leg but what you got to keep in mind is the volume and ellipsis involved and and how the the leg is constructed in order to um, justify that curve and 
and and and because your ellipses are almost straight you're nerfing the perspective of the feet and uh, even more so uh, because of the the foot is flat on the horizon which is is wrong because we're looking based on the perspective we're looking the horizon line is here so if the c a cylinder is flat there but we should see the cylinder more here right because it's and if it's above us we see the top of the cylinder more and the underside we don't see and the same for for this one right we see the the bottom of the ellipse so that means we need to see his foot placed in the world uh, more like in actual perspective, right? So we can't uh, we can't see his fat f fat his foot flat <laughs> from the side. That also means all the ellipses need to adhere adhere to the the perspective. And there's a lot of problems with that when it comes to uh, one thing you have to keep in mind is like if I reach my hand towards the camera, the ellipses change, right? The, the, we see the ellipses inwards now, right? But they still have to follow the horizon line. But what if I raise my arm like this, right? So then the ellipse goes, it goes that way. And is pointing away from the horizon line, but they still sit in in perspective, right? So that that's something you got to keep in mind when doing all these volumes. Is that when you're choosing to make those straps rather straight on, you're nerfing a lot of volume. So you have to decide: is the arm coming forward, or if it's straight to the side? Why is it straight out to the side? And then why is does he have his arm tucked, elbow tucked in towards the body and arm further down in? And it creates this awkwardness, even though he's standing, you know, like uh, wide chested, and the arm should be naturally like pointing forward because that's how you stand. You don't, you don't lock the elbow, even though, you know, if you're going to stand straight with the arm still straight like that, that his elbow has to go really far back and behind his back, yet he isn't. You know, so it's it becomes this confusion. It becomes this flat flattening of flattening of uh, volumes, which is very subtle. But if you have a look at people that are really good at volumes like that, they don't do that mistake. And that is the key one thing that helps a pose come across as volumetric or alive or standing in a place is because all these tiny little decisions are being made accurately and, uh, and not uh, based on icon thinking like arm straps one flat perspective it's correct because it's placed correctly but it's not in, in world in the world correctly so that's something uh, you really got to think about when you, you when you're doing stuff like this is the volume aspect of the perspective and the placement of the major volumes like the elbow versus the arm how is that rotation happening and if he stands that way how does his arm have to be same with feet same with uh, legs and so on what should we see more of what should we see less of what would be turning in perspective what would not be you know Um, like the general rule for elbows is that they touch the tip of the hip bone so his elbows are there while the tip of his uh, hip bone is well you're actually indicating it to be there so there I am standing standing corrected <laughs> but then you have to question why is his hip bone top of the hip bone there and his rib cage starts there and usually anatomically you you fit your your fist uh, 
between your flying rib and the hip bone, top of the hip bone. You can ram your fist in there in the side. That's a, the usual proportion, right? You can try it yourself. Just put your fist into the side of your belly underneath the ribs and your pinky will be touching the hip bone and uh, your top will be touching your flying rib, the loose rib on your rib cage. Uh, so that distance is too short, most likely. I mean, this is just a general proportional rule. You know, we, of course you can break it, but it's something to be aware of so that you can break it based on knowledge and not uh, on mistake. So the same goes for the like this is the ellipse of the the thing right and uh, the thing the hip um, and the the sword is kind of hanging forward and this one is hanging up a little bit. I would probably have it pointing more towards us and into the uh, drawing a lot more. And the reason reason behind that decision is to give more complexity to the to the pose if you uh, like make Egypt type posing with the accessories like the same with the arm same with the knife you're flattening the perspective um, So I would make the, the perspective more complex by studying the placement of the handles and how is the perspective correctly. Because when you're angling the sword inwards into the picture, into the center, like right, so the center line of him, his uh, belly and, and, and thing, right, goes there. That's his center line. And if you're directing the, the handle in towards the center, you're naturally placing this handle as well in perspective because that's what your your intention is, right? Your intention is to show that he has two knives on each side of the hip. So th th that the decision alone gives you also some indication of perspective and what you need to do to other elements. You know, like so that probably is too too flattened. all these kind of perspective decisions become uh, become apparent. So the same here goes for, like I talked on this leg, it's about the internal structure of the leg and placement of the things in order to make them look the way they do. And a lot of these soft curves that just go through the character actually lessens the impact of the anatomy and creates more confusion and when there's more natural flow of shapes and placement our brain just goes that's how it's supposed to be when when it's not our brain starts thinking why is it this way i i, I see something is off but i don't understand why because there's a leg i know my brain says that's a leg but then you know there's a confusion there I think that being said, <laughs> with shitting on your uh, anatomy and, and, and perspective, I think it's a cool design. I think it's a nice uh, imagination of a reimagination of, of skeletor. Skeletor. I think, much like the, I talked about, um, the hair shadow grouping of. Um, Jacob Mobley, you have to also, in this instance, consider the sizes of your elements and how you're grouping them in the image. You know, there's a, a lot of similar sized objects. So like the distances of all these things, you really need to be careful of. Do I need them to be same sized objects scattered across his chest? Whereas could I have the more dominant statement uh, in order to have 
these uh, more smaller objects around it. So it's usually a very subtle shift, but it's an important shift that helps indicate it, uh, like the rhythm of things. I'm going to exaggerate just to, to kind of prove the point. So now I scaled up the bones, right? And now all the other objects around it become secondary, right? We, 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 we read it differently. So if I switch that down, now that is competing with all the other shapes around. So they're all, because they're all equal, right? They're all equal in size, more or less. So that rhythm becomes, becomes thrown off. So that when we scale it up, primary read is the bone. Secondary read is all the supporting information around. Uh, but what if we would um, um, come on, copy these things? Now they become primary, right? So you can even combine them. <laughs> so now it becomes just a game of who should have the most say in the design. And the problem is when there's not enough statement and there's just kind of this careful carefulness of equal equality and there's no there's there's uh, needs to be a clear rhythm, much like the shoulder pad. Well, much like this shoulder pad, there's the blue is the dominant. Um, the the leather straps are the contrast point, and the uh, fur is the second read or third read. The contrast we read first this, but shape wise, the blue is the dominant. They have the most uh, real estate. So that's the kind of how 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 you should start planning things. I, I know that you are doing it. I can see it in the way you adding the contrast with the straps, the, the bones, etc. But um, especially on his chest, it's very careful, and it needs to be a stronger, clearer rhythm. That's it for you, Eric. No more love for you. Okay, now it's Schillstrand. Schillstrand! <laughs> so, there is some funkiness happening here. I think, first of all, the, the picture as a whole is really cool. Uh, composition works quite well. Um, I think there is certain points that you could question. So let's let's start let's start shitting. <laughs> I'm gonna shit on it. Not really, but. There's points to be made. First of all, I think the composition could use more, more central spacing. Uh, secondly, um, if we think about my comments to Eric Moy about uh, volume and direction of ellipses, uh, and in in your instance, it's a third thing you need to think about because Eric. Um, it's warm in my office. Uh, one thing Eric didn't do is indicate light direction and volume with uh, light light volumes. So looking at your arm over here, uh, the intensity of the white is equal, even though you're indicating that his arm is coming towards us. But now I'm going to talk about anatomy then, uh, one thing. But his lower arm is really long, which means we're seeing it from the side. The proportions are from the side, yet 
we are looking at it like in perspective like this because the, the intensity of the ellipse yet his 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 arm is like that length so that that that's the first mistake here is that it needs to be shorter because it's in perspective Um, just as a um, kind of heads up to my feedback, like I, I mentioned it before on other extra, extra streams, but the feedback is how to save your painting or design. If I would do it uh, from the beginning, I would do it differently and there would be a completely different kind of base, right? The base is what dictates the painting, so I could, I could most likely the best is, would be to repaint everything but then the, the, it's not yours anymore right it becomes my underpainting it becomes my choice of placement it becomes my proportions etc and, and that's not going to help you that much so what I try to do in these uh, feedbacks is to just sp uh, spot the mistakes that's the, the biggest because I, I'm a strong believer that the most obvious mistakes are the are the ones you need to work the most on, and when that's dealt with, knowledge-wise, I can start. You know, if if you would do the next two-week challenge, I could say, oh yeah, here's your next thing you need to work on. Rather than, you know, I would not do the do the same decisions that you've done, but you have done these decisions now, so. We are at that place. Right? We, I can't just say, "Oh, I wouldn't do this," and <laughs> that wouldn't help you anything. You would still go to the stand there and go like, "Right," and and what should I do now? Anyway, so there's a lots of an anatomical mistakes. Um, most a lot of it is volume. Like, like I started saying about in the arm here, the intensity of the light, um, you need to make sure it's uh, coherent in the full volume of the arm. Um, you know, much like the, the Terminator I talked about for for um, Jacob Mobley about shadow groups that dictates the shadow groups, etc. You got to think about because you're a three D guy, so you got to think about the, the where the the facets are pointing in three D space, which would receive the the highest glare or intensity of the light, and which would not. I mean, the light source of the monitor is from there right so the points facing um, towards the the light source gets the most intensity so if if his arm gets the the intensity of the light even across his arm it means the light source is from um, that that light source right i don't know if it shows on the screen uh, that means the light is for between the night and him right up here and if it's not then it look what it looks like is from behind them so the intensity needs to be on the shoulder and, and probably on the the roundness of his uh, elbow guard to indicate that the form is pointing towards that direction but you can't have it equal across the arm because then you're making a statement in, in, in volume that's incorrect. So same goes for his arm. As it's being shielded by the body, it needs to sit more correctly with when it comes to intensity. And also, I think this kind of L shape. I get what you want. You want to indicate motion, but it's a little bit too hard. The edge. And what you got to do is 
probably you know there's a, an, uh, there's a 12, a 12 animation rules in Disney um, and one of them stating you should never show the action mid mid motion but uh, like pre <laughs> pre or post right so if someone's hitting don't show the moment of impact but show just before the punch the load up or after the impact that you see the effects of the punch right so the same with motion um, if you want to show rotation don't show the whole thing just in one motion show the uh, history of the cape moving in a, in a curve so with the, the whole talk about light the same goes for here I also think the ellipses are too too odd and I think the arm needs to be bent if he's going to be able to hold it like that Uh, I like the way you indicated motion with motion blur, but a lot with motion blur, if it's object based, um, if it's a sword, the closer to the hilt, the less motion there will be because the point of rotation is the most at the tip of the blade, right? All right. Hey, thanks for the follow, Cesar de Almeida. Probably butchered your name, but so. What you gotta do is, hey, Monkle Floyds, cheers for the follow. So what you gotta keep in mind is uh, keeping the motion further out of an object. If it's motion-based motion blur, if it's camera-based blur, then it's a different set of uh, things you need to keep in mind. So uh, I think it's cool. I think the blood is nice. Um, I like the, the placement of the wolves, but one thing to keep in mind, all of the wolves are, have an open mouth and all of them have the tongue out and uh, I'm suspecting it's a copy-paste job. <laughs> so what you might want to do is uh, have different um, states of behavior of the wolves and also different placement of them because now he's looking at another wolf off frame right you, you want the wolf to to look at the night and, and be angry and show his teeth or is it a werewolf I don't know but you can't have it you know it's too much repetition It might be a copy paste job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and another thing with like uh, tangents is about the wolf and the and what's happening here. I mean, one way you could indicate the leg to help. Um, you could take that leg into the silhouette of the helmet and a foot or whatever. Uh, to help the the story here of how how that uh, what in, what's happening between them the knight is chopping him in half uh, but having it just kind of just hugging the the shoulder makes the shoulder look like it has a spike on it so by simplifying that interaction and making the interaction somewhere else you're going to help dictate the rhythm of the painting differently. Um, and it's a good thing that what you did with the material. I asked, I already mentioned it on Discord. Uh, but much, like I said, much like um, Jacob Mobley about the volumes, you need to pay attention more to the volumes, especially when you decide to make light. You need to have the light correct. Uh, another thing here with the arm and the ellipsis it's all very uh, all very broken you need to make sure the 
the ellipses you're making, you can't cheat. Because the second you cheat and make it up without a proper f f f foundation, it's going to look broken. And your mind is going to see the arm, understand that it's a bent arm, but it's something is broken and you don't know what it is. So what, what's important is you figuring out the rotation, the placement of the, all the limbs, and the actual motion, right? So he's swinging, or he's maybe actually stabbing, which means, you know, he, he, he has to put his elbow correctly, and you need those ellipses correctly. And without it, that those ellipses are indicating his shoulder is going forward, right? But then we see the arm pointing down, grabbing the hilt. So you can see the rotation of the... Uh, even though there's some twist in my shirt on my UV map. <laughs> so he's from the side with the arm, but the ellipses are indicating it's going like that, right? And then I oh, it's just broken. Hey, me machine, glad you could make it. Yeah. So that that being said, um, you really need to pay attention to ellipses more. It's a very common mistake. Um, a lot of people make that mistake, so don't worry about it too much. Just be aware of it, and. Uh, the more you're aware of a problem, the more you'll automatically be adjusting to the to it. Um, and now uh, there's the point of like, where's the where's the rhythm going in the painting, right? So what what's the point? What's the focal point? At the moment, it's by the in between these two. You know, that could be a good focal point, but maybe you also want to indicate the ferocity of the impact, right? So that's something you could play with. And the problem with uh, using a texture sprite for blood splatter uh, without playing with it correctly is uh, you're uh, like ghosting the tongue with the spray. So the, the tongue becomes a part of the spray, or the spray becomes part of the tongue. And it becomes a two-dimensional projection. So what you got to think more when you're doing it next time is, is imagine it in a 3D space, right? So maybe it's splashing as a... Like maybe it's a, moving the head and it's, and it's the splashing. But now it's just a dish, sprite. Which probably is not very helpful to help sell the illusion of depth. Um, another thing I would probably play with is if you use a color dodge uh, layer and I use a big soft brush, you can go in and and very subtle in a subtle way start shifting the gradients uh, you established in, a, in an interesting way. Uh, so it doesn't really matter that much what color you choose, but having it mid-range and saturated helps color dodge to, to impact the gradient you've already established. But then you can go in and, 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 and shift that with a hue saturation quite easily and you can get uh, desired like material behavior or light behavior in whatever situation you need so uh, that's a small little hint to to add uh, complexity to your gradients that you already established so the, the change is subtle uh, but it adds uh, complexity to it Yes, that would be it for you.
lots of anatomy mistakes general just ellipse issues like everyone has um, proportional problems but all in all a very cool pin good job and uh, this is her first one nice Okay, this is Sayarts. He didn't finish. Hey, Monkle Floyds. Cheers. <laughs> My pleasure, Jacob Momley. Like I said, I could I could like go dig into details further, but I find it unnecessary if there's a more obvious uh, problems that you can address to make them better. So. So this is Sayarts. Um, he didn't finish, as you can see. Um, so I'm most likely not going to spend too much time on it, as it's not finished. Uh, he went on vacation. Um, but the biggest problem I see is um, all the values are equal strength, equal intensity. Um, so just looking at it and doing like a, a squint test, like if you if you make mm -hmm. If you make your eyes into uh, um, small slits so that you can't focus, and uh, and and you just uh, look at the image as an extremely blurry thing, usually what you can do is you see groups of light, you see groups of shadows, you see groups of contrast, but in his instance, the only thing that pops out is like the sphere and uh, the guy's headgear uh, and if we squint with colors even more so we, we don't know where we're, we were supposed to look right so one thing a, a friend of mine pointed out on an old old painting many many years ago of mine was was that he saw my lighting condition what i intended but not what i followed through with much like uh, the whole idea about uh, ellipses in perspective proportions in anatomy and so on that is theoretically looks correct but it's incorrect so your brain gets confused same goes with uh, lighting conditions so if there is an explosion behind them, they, in theory, right, should have um, like rim light from the explosion because of how how the eye works, how the camera works. We can't see all contrast at all volumes. Um, if there is a really strong light source, right? The light source that's dominant is going to take over the exposure of our eyes, right? We're going to just see the main light source as a dominant thing and everything else, our eyes are going to adjust, much like driving a car when the sun is ahead of you. You can't just accept the sunlight and accept the light of the cars ahead of you and the reflections. They're not going to be an equal strength <laughs> of, of intensity, right? The sun is going to take over. So you need to block the sun so that you can see all the other light that's important <laughs> when you're driving. So then it comes, uh, comes to a question about, all right, so the problem is there's a huge explosion behind them. Uh, the problem lies then that there's a sphere in front of them that they're trying to grab, right? And that light is uh, giving off a light source. So what, to what degree um, do we need to arrange the light to make sense 
So, narratively, is the explosion warranted? Or is the light of the sphere warranted? I mean, looking at Sayard's original composition, I would say the explosion is secondary and the light of the sphere is primary, right? But he did add an explosion. So what I would do, this is me making a statement for Sayart, right? Make the explosion more intense. Make that kind of the primary light source, right? It becomes a narrative. It becomes the point where, which indicates why they are there and uh, the ferociousness of why they're, this guy is like screaming fuck, right? It's not for nothing. So that means the second issue then, if it, there's a strong light source ahead of them and a strong light source behind of them, how can we make that lighting condition work uh, to our advantage. So one thing would be, which we all know, is a warm light source, cool shadows, right? So that's why I deliberately made it much more purple and, and, and darker, the valley range. Because then we we want to reiterate the orb that they're chasing. So in order to reiterate the fact that they're chasing this orb and it's the primary secondary light source. <laughs> uh, say art, you're not making it easy for me. So what you got to do use is contrast, right? We need to make sure that this contrast point becomes the most important one. Secondary is uh, their silhouette and uh, the explosion behind them, right? So that, that's the interaction we have to, do, to deal with, that we got to solve. Um, I'm not doing a good job, by the way. I'm, I'm very heavy-handed in my paint over. But enough excuses. Let's try to make it work. Um, it's almost like I'm using a mouse <laughs> when I'm doing these paint overs. Just blah blah, blah. shit on everything. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, contrast help to sell the idea of where we should be looking, right? So if, if we do the squint test now, and we squint, we see the hierarchy of the, the orb, the darkest, them, less, uh, and background. Right, so now it, that part passes the squint test. Um, so if we go back to uh, Nefa's paint over in the early, in the beginning of the stream about edges, we should keep that in consideration as well. But as Sayard didn't finish, I don't want to spend too much time on Sayard's uh, entry as it, he didn't uh, finish it. So I'm just going to do this little thing. So now we can clearly see a stronger hierarchy and so on. And uh, the, the fact that he struggled with it, the fact that he uh, indicated he didn't know how to, to make it better, this would be the easiest and, and cleanest way to help the piece go further. Uh, and here everything is just equal strength, equal intensity, equal color, and you're lost. Here is a clearer, more defined solution to it. Even though he might choose to do it differently, this would be one way how I would do it making a rim light of the explosion in the background 
and then um, you could indicate subtle warmer tone as a reflection in their eyes and so on of what they're chasing. Uh, but like I said, heavy-handed edits to make it work. Uh, and it would be differently. You need to build it base up. Uh, so this is a quick fix. Anyways, that's Sayert. So much work. What did you write, Jacob, Bobby? Jacob Obley, yeah, sure. Just put it on the Share Your Art channel in uh, Discord. Well, why not? We're all in there. We're all in there together. So this is uh, Bart Sparrow's entry. I am not sure really um, which game or movie he contributed to. It looks like some sort of samurai. Um, Not sure, really. Uh, but basing basing it on this, um, if you rotate the horizon uh, as it is in indicated, he is uh, not standing straight. Um, you know, sometimes you wanna you wanna mess around with the horizon line. The problem is then. Um, like if you want to have it that way, you should probably have um, indicators that, that help define um, the perspective more. You know, if it's a hill, try to show the curvature of the hill or show uh, continuation of the perspective in the background stuff like that to help sell the idea of a, um, perspective in, in you know tilted perspective uh, and then when it comes to light intensity uh, I would knock your whites back And then think about it strategically. I'm, I am going to use overlay, but that is just a heavy-handed way to show a result for you, right? Ideally, you'll be more conscious about it and paint it more consciously. But let's say there's a rim light behind him, right? So the sword, I'm assuming this is the sword maybe catches a intense highlight at the end of the sword. Not as intense as the sword's highlight, but still brighter than the rest of the scene. Maybe it's his back flag, his banner, right? And then you can indicate the volume of, of his, his cape, even though I think it's too much banana shape on the cape. It's too much one equal change of form and an even bend. That's really not how cloth and, and so on moves, right? They have a they have weight, a mass, the cloth, and an anchor points on the body. That's why, for example, a shirt hangs the way it does, creates the lines the way they do, the folds down the arm the way they do, is the mass of the fabric. All shirts don't fall the same way. All coats don't fall the same way. It's all depending on material. But they never, never equally like uh, increase in mass and bend at a simple curve, because that indicates no weight to the fabric and no point of anchoring the the, the gravity on top of a form, right? So that if something stretches and the fabric moves, there's a stress point from the fabric to where the point it touches. And it's never the same point across the fabric, right? That's why there is folds. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and play, just play around with the light. I'm gonna, if you want to use overlay, 
use overlay um, if that makes you happy I would just as a as just as a general kind of you don't need to do it I am doing it so that to prove a point right so just just kind of play around with what, what that what that does to the scene um, to the volumes try to accurately describe the volumes with the light uh, and if you look at the older uh, uh, two-week challenge paint over sessions I talk a lot about uh, cardboard people <laughs> I like uh, is when you just do one intense intensity highlight rim light of all like left facing forms uh, it makes them look like they're car made out of cardboard so we're like one centimeter thickness so that's incorrect right you need to have volumetric rim light you need to think of the rim light as a on a 3d form so that takes some thinking takes some studying uh, but yeah so so start with those things and start think about light more and uh, form and uh, material and so on uh, so there's some issues with posing and, and perspective and so on and, but uh, thanks for joining in on the two challenge it, uh, we're glad to see a, a new face to it uh, but I can see some some clear problems with uh, um, fundamentals so practice fundamentals build the drawing up from the base up so draw um, volumes correctly and then make those volumes into description of folds or, or arms so basic geometry like cylinders and, and spheres etc and, and understand the placement of them one good thing about uh, like practicing anatomy I used to do um, uh, for example is you you draw from reference let's say you draw from reference uh, like a guy sitting and, and thinking with it like whatever he has his uh, wrist cocked or, or pivoted um, and his leg up and the other leg underneath coming at right and he's uh, he's drinking coffee so that's the reference right you find a fantastic photo of someone sitting at the table having his cup of joe right so the challenge then which is a great challenge for practicing understanding your volumes and your 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 drawing of what you've seen is I call it the 360 <laughs> 360 spin is a torturous horrible exercise but it's extremely informative of how you're thinking so you go what does the guy look like from the back I can see in the reference he has a slight tilt to his hip that leg is this leg right so in perspective it, it goes up over that leg and then we see the leg coming down so that leg needs to be coming down and then that leg crosses over which means it crosses over this way we should see the foot here all right so here's the chair he's sitting on here's the leg all right so then he has a slouch that means the cylinder goes down the neck goes up the head is, is pretty much straightforward that's fine that arm is that elbow are far out towards us or straight most likely looking at the imaginary reference um, which there should be a real life reference probably he has it a lot more forward because he leans the weight uh, 
on the wrist, right? Then the hand goes down, his head is there, and then the other hand, probably elbow is cocked more out because he's having coffee, and the coffee comes there. And then you go, all right, what does he look like? Three quarter view from above. And then you draw, you know, his hand under the jaw. Uh, elbow out, holding coffee cup, leg over the other leg, going down in perspective, ellipsis that way, and you just do 360 spins of everything. And, and, and what I did was I measured, uh, I measured the drawing, so if he sits there drinking his coffee cup, I draw him from the front there, drinking his coffee. I draw the three-quarter view here, and all based from one photo, and I try to rotate it around. What does the volumes, how does the volumes, volumes look? And, and then a top perspective view, bottom perspective. And it so helps you understand directional volumes. Because it's easy to think the guy uh, here as a icon, like as a going to the toilet picture of a man. Right? You don't think about the volumes. All you're thinking about the relationship of the lines between each other, not of the actual volumetrics of the character sitting in that 3D space. So having to rotate the camera is a really interesting way to force feed your mind that way of thinking. That would be apparently you got some extra love paid over uh, for you, uh, Bard. So this one was the Hero John. Um, the feedback for Hero John um, is the same for uh, Nefas, which was the one of the, in the beginning about edges. This. If you just uh, hero John uh, listen to all the other feedback, you will start uh, understanding the the weaknesses here. There's lots of soft edges. There's no not enough definition. Uh, light is flat. We don't understand the three D space relationship between all the objects, um, and so on. Uh, so just go back, listen from the beginning of the stream, and apply it to yours, and. Uh, that being said, this is a work in progress, so you didn't finish, so I feel like uh, it's not like you're not worthy of more feedback, but you haven't finished, and I don't know where you would take it. So I would just say go listen to the other people's feedback and uh, take that as you're moving forward, if you choose to take this forward. Uh, but cool, thanks for the entry, and uh, Contra 2, by the way, is an awesome game, so good choice. Um, so just take a listen to the other feedbacks, and you'll get it, you'll get it for sure. Hey, Belial, Belial, Bel Belial, hello. Okay, last one, Mr. Lou Rib. It's a really cool piece, Sly, it's a nice game, I never played it actually, uh, it's a, it always wanted to play it, I remember, looking back at it, it's like, oh, what kind of cool game is that, uh, I would love to have done it, but, alas, no, no, no fun for me. Um, so I think compositionally it works pretty good um, the idea comes across there's a certain things though I will touch upon 
what I do think is cool is is the amount of progress you've made, uh, Lurid. Uh, it's crazy. <laughs> I remember, uh, like, what eight months ago. Uh, not to be not to be too harsh or anything, but your drawing ability uh, was far, far from this. You struggled. You struggled to paint. And, and then seeing this is pretty cool. It's really, really cool. All right. That being said, There's certain statements you've chosen to make in this painting, uh, which I th I think I need to uh, question. Like if the time of day day in this scene we uh, agree on, it's like sunset, right? Dawn, setting is set, just set. There's indirect light. Uh, from the sky, from the setting sun at the horizon. There's purple, which means it's a uh, certain temperature, whatever. That's that's arbitrary, but the color treatment is cool. So we can't, we can't shift the temperature. We can't add stronger light because the situation is the way it is, right? Time of day. So biggest issue number one is the tangent of his staff. It's it's just at the silhouette of his uh, tail and just on the edge of the thing, and it drives me crazy. <laughs> Why? <laughs> You are not allowed to go to Tangent City, Lurib. You gotta make sure that those kind of things... Because that the fact that you, you put them just at the silhouette on both locations... Uh, just... You're losing... What you're doing is literally making the 3D aspect of the scene into a 2D sprite object. It's a 2D side scroller now. He has the perspective flat on the, the board. His staff is flat on the edge of the board. And he doesn't exist in a 3D space at the moment, even though he's rendered that way. He's just flat on there. It makes me crazy. <laughs> So, what I would do is play with it more. So either have it that part inside of the tail and separate them with light and have the staff um, intersect the, the volumes. Right? He's sitting, holding that thing. And the staff is going into the painting. We get that interaction, right? So the problem, one problem, potential problem with that is why is he leaning it in? But you know, it could be a relaxed pose. He could just be sitting with it. Uh, you know, it it doesn't break the illusion, right? But it does aid the sense of three D space. So that being said, in, in, in order to make it more apparent that one object is in front of the other, nuke the intensity of the light slightly and indicate the rim light uh, so that the objects are being separated more. And what you could probably do is, is uh, with temperature, help the tail being pushed into perspective more uh, with these uh, purples and then having the the thing in front help aiding the, the balance. Uh, 
I think overall though it's a pretty cool painting and like I said you've done major strides um, secondly is the sign is electrical or is it painted sign in a way maybe you should have a neon I haven't played the game so I don't know if they used neon lights um, but if if they did you know it would be a a cool help to help indicate more of a 3D space. You know, you could even help by adding more atmospherics by, by having bloom and so on, bounce lights. Like, uh, like I said, there's, there's certain states, statements uh, you can choose uh, that'll help um, indicate the painting. And if you disregard some of those moves, there has to be a reason by, behind them, right? So you have to consider what do I want to say? What is the placement of them? And, and, you know, uh, what's the reasoning for not having them versus the reasoning for having them. And whatever decision you make, uh, you got to make sure to follow through, right? So, yes, it's a neon sign. So the reasoning for it to be a neon sign, sign is probably lore, right? Because he, he's at jazz clubs. But then use that fact uh, to help sell the illusion of him being there. So mu much like a lot of things that need saturation to to be sold, as a you know, oh, it's neon light, it's intense light. You also need uh, the opposite, less intense light. But that also means saturation. So if something is highly saturated, you also need desaturated things. So I would start adding uh, grays, um, slight purples into the board, and uh, uh, and the like the scenes you've chosen at places and so on to just help um, create a more complicated palette so that the neon becomes more neon because there's less saturation around it at places right so the intensity of the board you know you could probably insert some of the oranges in there um, to help help sell the illusion of it right now there's one Russian guy I think he's Russian Uh, oh, it's the same guy as, uh, as uh, Piotr. Piotr. Um, but what I wanted to say about the complexity behind those shadows, uh, he he has this personal series where he paints uh, like alleyways. Of, of of this cat, um, so here here is one of those paintings that this Piotr Jablonski Jablonski uh, does um, when it comes to, um, for example, like uh, intensity of contrast or intensity of saturation, intensity of shadows, um, and all these things, right? Um, uh, this one. So here we can see. I don't. I don't know if you see the. Oh, you don't see the Parker because it's not Photoshop. Um, the center wall has saturation going into the shadow, versus it has a stronger um, edge contrast towards the left. Same for the ground 
going away from the central ball to the left very much lost shadows but there's a huge shift and and all those little soft little plays with with relationships and uh, then you get to the window which has saturation then there's a high contrast point then there's a uh, uh, brighter sections then goes a huge high contrast dark part but it's not black and it's not one tone it has subtle shifts in it and you can apply that to the rest of it where is the the contrast point, where's the saturation shifts, where's the subtle uh, hue shifts, like on the forehead of the cat at the top, where the sticks are pointing towards the forehead. There's a pool of saturation. There's uh, gray zones around it. There's blue. There's a cyan in the black at the top of the cat, just to indicate mm, like living colors, right? So that being said, like looking at um, looking at your painting, you should really, really focus more on that as well. You're getting to that point now that, that you need to incorporate these things as a narrative tool when you're painting more because you're getting you're getting more and more parts to it. So so the the, the sooner you, you start thinking about it, the easier you're going to have. But there's a still a lot of like big picture things that you you're struggling with, like the the thing pointing the arrow pointing in has this super spindly legs, which looks like a oil rig, <laughs> far off in perspective, and there's no three D aspect to it. You know, how is this thing constructed? Cable maybe. And much like a lot of these things, you need to to make sure that um, don't think in icons only. Start thinking about uh, painting as a whole, as a narrative, as a story that you want to tell. Why is it the way it is? How can you add things to embellish the idea? So uh, you, know, you really need to one step up. And a fun little thing I showed you, you guys on a stream earlier, was the the whole uh, boost the saturation and uh, have a brush that scatters and paint in saturation. I think it adds quite nice complexity, and it could be a nice little uh, boost in your process. In, in how you want to tackle more complexity in a, in a painting. And then you, of course, as it's a correction mask, you can go in and paint it away at places where it's too much, and so on and so on. Uh, but it does need more. It's a great start. You just need to take it that one step further and think about it really uh, a lot more. That's cool, though, Riv. I'm glad you dig it. Yeah, exactly. See, that's Nick Nick Ponim, his screen name, but his name is Piotr Jablonski, or I'm butchering his name. It's not easy to say. I mean, look at that. What are those letters? Oh, you can't see. What are those letters? J-A-B-L with a line through it, which is like a rune. Oh, N with a dot over it, and then ski. No idea. Please note also um that um the stream grays out a lot of it so there's a lot of subtlety that doesn't show in the stream um so keep that in mind and uh 
Firefox that? Firefox crashed. So thanks very much, Doctor Something. Um, I can't see the stream window. Doctor Robot Vinick. Thanks very much for the follow. So that being uh, being the last of the two week challenge pinovers, I will uh, I will call it a night. Tomorrow morning uh, will be the new or tonight most likely will be the new two week challenge. Um, it will be for probably the Sunday in two weeks because I might not be in the office on Saturday um, so thanks to everyone for joining in and thanks everyone for joining in on the two week challenge it's uh, it's good fun I think the next two week challenge might be to do a counterpart. Oh, so no. thanks to everyone for joining in, and thanks everyone stop. for joining in on the two week challenge. It's uh, stop. It's good fun. I th I can hear the echo. So I think next two week challenge might be the, to do an opposite. So let's say you have a Sonic character what would be the opposite of Sonic I mean obviously it would be Dr. Robotnik but would it be the opposite of Sonic or the a good prince what is the opposite of a good prince that might be the next two week challenge the opposite of your favorite villain or hero hmm maybe Opposite attracts. There we go. Or Dr. Robot Vinick. All right. Thanks everyone for joining in. It was an absolute pleasure hanging out with you guys tonight. Uh, thanks everyone for joining in the two week challenge. If you want to join in on the two week challenge, go to Twitch, which I'm streaming at. And underneath the Twitch window is a link to the Discord. And just click it, come and hang out. There's a bunch of awesome people there. And if you see this on YouTube, better make it to the twitch otherwise leave a comment like all that bullshit statistics matter if you want to get sponsors to give you guys free stuff so again thanks everyone uh, catch you on discord uh, with the new to challenge and uh, have a great one outro time outro time good night good day